Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the zoo. The minions with me this evening are Adam. Hello. And Functional is here, but not here last we checked, so he will be joining us once he finishes up what he needs to do. But we will also be joined by Dr. Functional at some point. And, of course, it is once again a Friday. I'm the keeper for this evening, Sanguine. How are you doing tonight, Adam? Uh, you know, I'm I'm doing all right. It's uh it's a Friday, so mm -hmm. I'm glad I can sleep in tomorrow. That'd be nice. Nice. Oh, and Rotten's saying that he's excited for tomorrow night's dinner that he'll be making. What are you going to be making, Rotten? Oh yeah, dude. What's for dinner? Wait a minute. Rotten corpse. This is not a grotesque dinner, is it? I hope you aren't not. going to be feral raccooning, are you? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think we've squared it away that cut cheese and slices of meat is uh... charcuterie, not feral raccooning. The moment that you start including goldfish crackers and gummy worms, you're feral raccooning. No, I think that's. Um... Okay, we don't <laughs> far too early in the show to to introduce that stuff. Nah, I think it's the perfect time. That is clearly feral raccooning. What type of homemade quesadillas are you making? Beef, chicken, lamb. Oh, whoa, hold on, hold on. Okay, so I actually ran across um, a bit where uh, it was in a Discord server and. The person was like, "Hey, here's a here's a bit. Um, butter of the pan. Toss mm -hmm. the tortilla on there. Flip it. Put some spices. And he didn't, you know, say like which spices he, you know, you you're supposed to put. He said your spices. And then flip it, and then add your ingredients, and then make your quesadilla." And his argument was, because somebody shot back and was like, oh, so adding spices and, you know, seasoning to your case. And his argument was, how often do you see it like a seasoning outside? Like, and that, to me, it's like, okay, like a simple seasoning, like salt, pepper, that's one thing. But maybe like, like um, the satsus, too. No, no. Uh, but like you know an actual like crusted seasoning on the outside of a quesadilla i'm sure they, i'm sure somebody's tried that yeah the one problem that i have with that is a lot of the spices that you would want to put on the outside of a quesadilla they're prone to burning well no well my initial thing was dude but once that's one thing if it's just a cheese quesadilla but if you have stuff inside that's kind of what you're trying to get the the flavor from not the outside well you can do the outside and it would work but like i said the main issue is that a lot of the spices that you would normally want to crust on something like that are spices that would burn easily because having like garlic hit your tongue the moment that you bite into your quesadilla that would be really pleasant having some chili powder immediately as you bite into your quesadilla that would be really pleasant but chili powder and garlic burn like a son of a bitch so it'd be better to put the have that stuff inside the quesadilla yes because that way it doesn't burn and if you burn garlic there's no saving that once you burn garlic all you can do is throw it out and start from scratch well hold on what would you put in uh, a quesadilla? Because cause there was also that argument of, of what you would, you know, like, uh, in terms of a pepper. And I'm like, couldn't you put a green pepper in it? And then, of course, somebody said, you put onions in it, but um, they are pagans. And, uh, no, uh, onions well, are correct. You no, put no, onions, no, no, mushrooms. No, no. You can do green peppers. You can do red peppers. You can do yellow peppers, orange peppers, harlequin peppers. Those are all acceptable. You can do spicy peppers. So the 
most mild spicy pepper people tend to acknowledge as something that's slightly spicy is a jalapeno. Oh, yeah. So you can do jalapenos. Pickled jalapenos are rather lovely. Mm. Well, it it was also it was also the inner. Oh, hello, yeah. functional. How it goes? I'm just finishing something up, but I'm here. Yay! What you finishing up? Mind your own damn business. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Aren't you McNosey McNoserson? Well, I mean, you brought it up. You brought that it. is true. But. Yeah, we're talking about quesadillas and what to put inside quesadillas at the moment. Yeah, and while we both agree that onions shouldn't be in a quesadilla, no, quesadillas peppers are... should have onions. Onions are delicious in quesadillas. Uh, but onions that's what I was everything. like. Yeah, that, that's what I said. Like it, French it's, onion ice cream. Mm. It's whatever you put inside. You could the caramelize them enough that it wouldn't be horrendous. And um, the uh, the spices, like, because uh, they also brought up guacamole and uh, the salsa that you would, you know, dip the, the quesadilla in. So the spices on the tortilla itself kind of is moot. Yeah, and like I said, when it comes to crusting a quesadilla with spice, the, the spices that you would most want to crust onto your quesadilla are the ones that are most likely to burn. Which yeah, you might not even get the spices. Well, it's not that you wouldn't get them; it's that you would get them burnt. Which, like I said, the mo and functional can back me up on this. The moment that you've burned garlic, you immediately bin whatever the fuck you've been doing, and you start from scratch. Basically, yeah. There's no saving burnt garlic. You Bam! Myth busted. Anything that you want to try to save it, it will fail. It will be bitter as all hell because burnt garlic is absolutely revolting and it will stain your tongue. You will taste just burnt garlic for an extended period of time. Yeah. I, I'm, you brush I, like I, several I, times and you're still tasting it. I feel yep. obliged to try it just to try it. Go for it. It is miserable. You will not enjoy it. But I like garlic. <laughs> I'm wild. Yeah, I fucking love garlic. Yeah. Burnt garlic is not something that is fit for human consumption. It's pretty rank. I mean, okay. Quesadillas aside. Um... Sanguine for you yes. cooking cooking a meal. Weren't you both co are you both cooking a meals? No. I had my dinner a little bit ago, yeah. I did a rice bowl with chicken and broccolini. So it was a honey soy glazed chicken with a fair bit of spice because I dumped in some sriracha for flavor. But did two types of soy sauce mixed together in order to get a really nice blend of the two. It was a matsutake mushroom shoyu as well as a smoked shoyu. Soy sauce and shoyu, they're the same thing. Shoyu is Japanese soy sauce. Soy sauce is can be any type of soy sauce, but if you say show you, it is Japanese soy sauce. That makes sense? Uh, yeah. So, I had the two soy sauces that I blend, a smoke and a matsutake, some honey, some sriracha, and a fair bit of ginger paste. Mix that together, then velveted my chicken marinating it in a little bit of baking soda, some sake, and a bit of potato starch. So that when I tossed it into the pan, it would get really beautifully brown. And it would also have a really nice mouthfeel to the chicken. Velveting makes 
a really smooth you, you know the difference between when you try to make stir fry at home and stir fry when you go to a Chinese restaurant how the meat feels different this was a question to you guys do you know what I'm referring to how I when you have don't know like, if it was me but you're cutting in and out could anyone hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly fine. I can hear you. Okay. So I asked, um, do you know how when you have like Chinese restaurant, chicken and broccoli, for instance, the meat yes. is really tender? Yes. Versus when you make it at home, the meat tends to be a bit tougher, right? Well, no. The secret behind that is velveting. It's something that is done at pretty much every Asian restaurant, but is very rarely done by home cooks. So, like I said, I velveted the chicken to give it that nice tender mouthfeel. Mm -hmm. And that was just baking soda, the actual thing that you need when you're velveting. And then I tossed in some sake and some potato starch. The potato starch just makes it brown really nicely. The sake just gives a nice flavor. So is it kind of like a marinade? Kind of. It's it when you sprinkle on the baking soda and you mix that in, it's just completely covering the meat. And then the baking soda breaks down certain protein bonds which makes it so that when the pan or when the meat hits the pan, those bonds don't tighten up and make the meat tougher. But then when you add in the other things like the sake, it becomes more of a marinade. <clears throat> but does, does it taste good? Yes, it makes it so that it's oh, yeah. extremely soft when you eat it. So like I said, it's the difference... You've had chicken and broccoli at a Chinese restaurant, I'm assuming, right? Uh, I can, I, I can, I think, I think it's safe to say that I have had chicken and, <laughs> and broccoli. And have you ever tried to make it at home? Hell no. Have you ever had someone Wait, else? No, try yeah, to make no, it yeah. No, yeah. I've, I've, I've tried, and okay. failed. Yeah, the meat came out a lot tougher, right? That's because he didn't velvet it. The Chinese place did. Velveting's breaking down those protein bonds with baking soda before cooking. It makes the meat more tender. Well, I guess if you need to treat the meat like royalty, uh, you get a nicer outcome. Eek. Oof. Oh, that's Oof. not really like royalty. In fact, it's peasant treatment. No, I said only because of the velvet aspect. Uh, True. Just a fancy but, name for it. Yeah, yeah it was, it's... and that's why it was a bomb of a joke. <laughs> but yeah, like I said, I did that velveted chicken, tossed into the pan, got it nice and browned up, then tossed in some scallion whites and the broccolini that I had chopped up cooked that up, splashed in a bit of water just to get the broccolini cooked the rest of the way through, then poured in my sauce, which was the two types of shoyu, sriracha, honey, ginger paste, and cooked that down until it was nice and sticky on all of the meat and all of the veg. Roasted up some green beans real quick, and then spooned some butter confit garlic into the rice mix that up mm. so that the rice was a nice roasted garlic rice with that lovely chicken and broccolini on top and the roast green beans it was delicious sounds good then with that i had a sake an Asahi, and a finger of Kaigen. I think I did the Kaigen. 
I either did the Kaigen. No, I think I did the Kaigen. Kaigen whiskey. I was trying to remember which of my Japanese whiskeys I had done with it. But I had done the Kaigen, standard Kaigen whiskey, which is a fairly nice Japanese whiskey. Yeah, I like a good Japanese whiskey. Mm-hmm. It's nice. The, the older Japanese whiskeys that you can get are always going to be better than the younger Japanese whiskeys. Just like any whiskey. Most Is that something that just... they started producing, like, recently? No. Terribly. Or is there, have they always had a version of... They haven't always had a version, but after the white ships opened up the um, Japanese coast to trade ships... Yeah, of course. The Japanese quickly fell in love with whiskey. And the first few breweries opened up... Or, sorry, first few distilleries opened up not very long after that. And since then, they've just been in love with whiskey. I mean, how could you not? No, it's because it, there, there's things like in, in my culinary journey that I learned over the years that like kind of blew my mind when I, mm -hmm. you know, tomatoes not being native to uh, Italy. Uh, uh, yeah, that region of, of Europe. Uh, uh, potatoes not being, you know, in, in Irish uh, or no, not Irish, Eastern uh, European. Eastern European or whatever. Like, it's just, it's just weird. It's like, huh, I, you know, when I found those out, kind of blew my mind a little bit. And I'm like, okay, interesting. And it's just like always looking for that next nugget of uh, food trivia that would like blow my mind. Like, oh, no, actually, you know, whiskey actually originates in Japan or something, you know, something like that. I know it, it doesn't, but, you know, just the next thing that would be like that. Yeah. The Japanese just really fell in love with Scotch whiskey. When it was yeah. introduced to them. So they started trying to come up with ways that they could make their own whiskeys. And they started off trying to just make clones of Scotch whiskey in order to mm -hmm. meet the demand for Scotch. But of they weren't. You can't do that. Yeah, you can't get it quite right. So what they started to do was they tweaked the recipe for Scotch whiskey. They followed a lot of the same practices, but then they changed like the type of wood. So you end up with Mizanara whiskeys, which are a very Japanese type of whiskey. That's in Japanese white oak, Mizanara yeah. oak. That's the thing and that I, you got. You got to transfer. You got to take the process and apply it to more local. But I mean, that makes sense because you. That's how you get. The difference between um, North and South fucking whiskey in in America. So yeah, yep. yeah, 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 and it also ended up with not only did you have the Mizanar Oak edition, but they changed the aging slightly. So when it comes to Scotch whiskey, it's double distilled five years in a day is the youngest Scotch that you'll be able to find. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Japanese whiskey, it's still double distilled, just like scotches, but it's three years in a day. So it follows hmm. more of an Irish aging. What, so what's your, what's y'all's take on uh, Canadian whiskey? <laughs> Canadian whiskey, it, there's some that are decent, but Canadian whiskey as a whole is... To my mind, one of the inferior types of whiskey, because you sons of bitches, oh. for some reason, go for double distilled, but then you age it shorter than fucking anyone else. And not only do you age it shorter than anyone else, but you also spike it with single distilled flavoring alcohol, as you phrase it. Wait, what? Huh? So they spike it? Yeah. So the way they're the... Bill Cosbying us. These Canucks are fucking. When you look at the different types of whiskey, you have you know Irish what? whiskey, which is triple distilled. Oh, Lord and then it's aged for three years in a day. 
You have Scotch whiskey, which is double distilled, aged for five years in a day. You have Japanese, which is double distilled, aged for three in a day. You have American whiskeys, which are double distilled, aged for two in a day. Then you have the youngest Canadian whiskey is one in a day. You can get a one-year-old Canadian whiskey. Also, while all the others, they did a single run of distillation. So it was double distilled, and it was two discrete runs of distillation, done. It was triple distilled, three discrete runs of distillation, done. Canadian whiskey, for some reason, does a single distillation, then they preserve a portion of that single distillation, and then they distill the remainder of that single distillation into a double distilled. But then they re-spike it with some of the single distilled, which gives it that you Canadians refer to it as the length of finish, which a good Irish whiskey, you feel... Like it's water on the tongue, water on the tonsils, water down the throat, hits your belly, you get the belly bloom. Delicious, fantastic, amazing warmth. Just radiates out from your stomach. You have scotch whiskey, same thing. It's supposed to be water on the tongue, water on the tonsils, water down the throat, hits your belly, blooms beautifully. You get just that warmth radiating out. American whiskey, you get a bit of the tongue, but then it's supposed to be fairly water on the tonsils. You might get a little bit of throat burn, but it's not supposed to be much. And then it hits the stomach belly bloom. Mm -hmm. For Japanese whiskey, again, you get very tip of the tongue and maybe the lips. It almost feels like Szechuan corn or peppercorns where it numbs the tip of your tongue and numbs your lips a little bit. But otherwise, if it's a half-decent one, it's then water all the way down until it hits your stomach, you get that belly bloom. And then you have Canadian whiskey. Like I said, they have the length of finish. The length of finish means that you feel it on your lips, you feel it on your tongue, you feel it in your tonsils, you feel it down your throat, it hits the belly, it starts to radiate that warmth, but the entire way down, it's burned. <laughs> I don't see a problem. Answer for your people, functional. <laughs> I don't see a problem. Wait, Doc. I like it when it burns. You're Canadian? Maybe. Oh, wow. Oh, I, I don't drink. I don't know any of these things, so. Uh -huh. But yeah, Come it's on. the thing that I have to give Canadians for shit for every time that I'm talking about it, because... It's the thing that confuses me. Because there are some really good Canadian whiskeys. They tend to be much longer aged. And some of them are increased distillation. So I went to one of the larger Canadian distilleries when I was up there a couple years ago for my birthday. And they have one line, which is Gooderham and Wart, I think it is. And Gooderham and Wart is a product of Canada, but it is brewed to the Scottish specifications. So it's double distilled, five years in a day, youngest. And they don't spike it with the flavoring whiskeys in that, or flavoring alcohols in that. It's just <laughs> double distilled. And it's delicious. Mm -hmm. That one I like. But the standard Canadian, where it has that flavoring whiskey, I don't get the love of the burn. Whiskey isn't supposed to you burn. Whiskey working. is supposed to be delicious. I don't think the two are mutually exclusive, but okay. It depends on how bad the burn is. Because the burn adds some off-putting flavors. Like, I've had some god-awful Japanese whiskeys. One of the first Japanese whiskey that I ever had was one of the most unpleasant whiskeys that I've ever 
imbibed in my life. It had the particular taste and texture of gasoline and ground glass. And that was because it had too many of the harsher volatiles still in it. It wasn't a good distillation. And that's the reason why you do increased distillations. The more that you distill an alcohol, the smoother it gets. The more that you age an alcohol, the smoother it gets because those volatile compounds burn off. Which is why adding those back in confuses me. And whilst some of them can have interesting flavoring to them, because every single compound has a slightly different flavor when it comes to brewing whiskey. I mean, but adding a whiskey flavoring to whiskey, it sounds kind of uh, odd. Well, it's the odd part is adding the single distilled back in. And not, I could slightly understand if you were adding certain aspects of it back in. So you were taking that single distilled and then you were distilling that for different compounds. And then you're adding in select compounds back in, but just adding in the full flavored whiskey or full single distillation whiskey back in. Because a lot of those notes end up being extremely grassy or bitter notes tend to be in the single distillation. Which is what most people are trying to get rid of when they're distilling. Hello, Sora. Giving Canadian shit for your spiking your whiskeys with single distillation again. <laughs> yeah. yeah, don't summon Sora. Nah, Sora's able to join if she wants to join. Oh, jeez. <laughs> it's another Along with Sora, Adam. The Canadian practice of spiking their double distilled with single distillation. I have no idea. I know I've drank stuff and like stuff and dislike stuff. That's about all I know. Yeah. Yeah. See, well, Sora doesn't drink Canadian whiskey. <laughs> although, one thing I do know is that Screech is fucking amazing. What is Screech? It's Newfie whiskey. It's like the, the scrapings from the bottom of the barrel. It's like really crazy stuff. Oh. Yeah. It's like you're making whiskey tea. Uh, it's I, I again. I don't know enough about the process to know what I'm talking about. I just know it has to deal deal with something to do with like the stuff that's stuck after the whiskey batches is, is aged in the cask. They scrape the stuff from the the lining and they turn that into a a drink. It's good. What kind of drink was it like a heavy drink or? It's like whiskey. Oh, it's alcohol. Do whatever you want with it. I like mine a little uh, on the, the a little chilled. So looking it up, and it apparently is a rum rather than a whiskey. Oh, huh. oh, really? And it is, I think, using like the really fucking dark black strap which is why they have to scrape it out in order to use it. So when you do sugar refining, every time that you refine the sugar, the portion that's left becomes darker and darker and darker. And that gives a different flavor. So if you have a first run molasses, it tends to be a lighter, more golden molasses. Whereas if you go for towards the end, that's when you start getting black strap. And if you go towards the very end, which is what it kind of sounds like it is. Yeah, it's a Demerara rum, but it is a dark Demerara run, rum. So you have different grades of sugar as you go through the sugar refining process. 
and it starts off with the most refined sugar, so the purest sugar is white sugar. Then as you go to later runs of trying to get sugar, you end up with darker and darker and darker sugars. So you have the purified sugar, which is white sugar. Then you go to golden sugar, or I think it's yellow sugar, golden sugar, brown sugar, turbinado, and demerara. Demerara is this really dark brown sugar that tastes almost raisiny. And then you have the molasses that comes out at the end of each of those distillations as well. Typically at the end of Demerara, you're down to black strap, which is really concentrated molasses. And that has that fairly raisiny taste. You remember the molasses that I used in order to make grog, Adam? Uh, uh, yeah. You remember yeah, how the grog a... had kind of a raisiny taste to it? it um, raisiny, ra is that the word? Uh, but yes, I, yes. I agree. <laughs> it did taste of raisin. Yeah, so it had that raisiny taste. It tasted like raisins. And that's because of all the levels of refining that had already happened. It concentrated all the flavors. That raisin flavor comes out fairly strong as you go through it. So it, it sounds like Screech is the... After they pour off the majority of the black strap, they scrape out the rest of the black strap, which is the darkest black strap, and then they make a rum out of that. Mm -hmm. See, I didn't even know it was rum. I, you put a liquid in front of me, I drink it, I'll tell you if I like it or don't. I just mm -hmm. never been one to be all up in alcohol. Mm. I tend to like knowing how things are made because it lets me know what processes I most enjoy. Oh, yeah. That's why I know about, like, well, basically know how cigarettes are made. But, like, find, find, uh, find smokables, like uh, the green variety, cigars, cigarellos, those kinds of things. The mm -hmm. things that are done more for... The pleasure of it rather than the addiction of smoking, which is what cigarettes are. Whoa. Yep. Have you ever seen those that new stuff where it's like, uh, and this is not an ad bit or anything, but like there's like this, um, I think it's like an e-cig e type of thing that's trying to get you to wean off of smoking cigarettes. Um, I don't know. I, I've been seeing a lot of ads on on YouTube. Yeah, those have been around for a while. Has they, it? They, they, I, they worked for me a couple times, but I don't know. I just like smoking. And I mean, if there's, if there's, if, if, if the pictures of all the, the scary stuff that'll happen to you when you're, if that doesn't like <coughs> deter you, learn about the process, learn about how they're made, what they're put in, what they're, what the, what they're treated with. I mean, from, from start to finish, the entire product is just meant and, and carefully crafted and engineered to make somebody addicted. They're, they're, they're insidious. There's, there's, there's no enjoyment out of it except for that, that, that mon that, that very fleeting, uh, nicotine rush you get when you first start, but that, that's the trick. Again, that's part of the, the, the insidiousness that are, that is the cigarette industry is that they're, from start to finish, meant to keep you addicted for life. Whereas, you know, things like cigars, cigarellos, those types types of that's for the enjoyment of the the product. Like the, the a really really good cigar is just like it's heavenly for me. Like that the, typically that's when I'll have a, a, a some scotch sanguine. Mm -hmm. Well, hold very, on, hold on. Very, what, what is what is very, the really very nice blonde tequila? 
what is the that was my go to back in the day was a nice cigar, like a really nice cigar and a uh, uh, glass of tequila. Well, yeah, what's what's the what's the difference between a really nice cigar and somebody having a? I mean, I don't I don't smoke cigarettes. It breeds of leaf. It's like it's like any kind of or uh, crop, right? It's coffee. It's it's tomatoes. It's it's whatever. It's it's a the type of the specific breed, which is you know carefully crossbred through multiple generations of of of, of creating this specific strain of a crop. And oh, okay, so, so the ones that are generally the most sought after because of their quality that increases their price, and you know the whole the whole you know chain obviously. Um, but what makes it that is also the care of the product, like a lot of the high, high, high end stuff, they're hand rolled. They're not machine rolled. They, the, 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 the people who roll them, it's like, uh, it's like anything else in, in the traditional world where this person has been doing it their entire life, who no, learned I've, it from somebody I've, I've, who did I've it their seen, entire life, who I've learned it from some, you know, so it, 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 it's a craft process. It's very meticulous. It's very, um, stringent on the process of doing that specific brand's role, and it all plays out. It all plays out again. It's it's something that's been developed over generations and generations to be its own product and to set it apart from other products. And so, if you're going to go out and buy like a five dollar cigar, you're going to get a machine rolled piece of crap. I mean, they they have a market for those. You roll blunts with them. You people posers. Uh, 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 smoke them to look cool, you know. I, I, but they smell like shit. The guy, the, the people who smoke them usually look like douchebags. Um, whereas if you're paying, obviously not always, but generally speaking, if you're paying 50, 60, 100, 250, you know, like you're, you're, you're going up in quality. I've had a $250 cigar. I didn't pay for it. I, I can't it one rolled by, a, but it was random Cuban lady. heaven, Adam. <laughs> you you have to be into that that sort of culture, that sort of yeah. you know, like like you know, with with anything, with 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 herbology, with uh, uh, alcohol, you know, you have to be into it. So obviously, but I know you you like your green. So when you've had really really cream of the crop, just mm, chef's kiss strains, you know why. No, you, I actually I don't. I, I I don't. You don't get obliterated and get the giggle fits and just like feel real good. And, no, no, you uh, you're no. Um, sure. uh, for me, uh, I mean, this this carding. Look, in terms of what you're talking about in the cigar stuff, mm-hmm. like, look, I I I get what you're saying. You know, there is it's hand rolled. You know, I understand the process. Um, just like I understand the process of uh, cultivating uh, a good wine or even the whiskey that we were talking about earlier. I mean, I understand all the process of it. Um, and you brought it up. Yeah, no, yeah. And I, I don't <laughs> have a hard time. I don't have a issue with it. Uh, I just found it funny that, you know, that it was a uh, funny haha, like I'm here to fucking amuse you. Yeah, uh, well, you know, to what do you do my little Homer dance? Switch it up there. But yeah, um, yeah, I tend to like to learn why things are as good as they are. Yeah, that's all I was looking looking at. So, when it comes to learning about different rums, for instance, because you just brought up Screech, Screech is a type of rum. Different rums, different nationalities of rum tend to use different levels of molasses in order to make them. So you have some like the really blonde rums. They're either using just straight up sugarcane juice or they're using really refined sugar. Mm. As you go darker in your rums, you tend to go for darker molasses, darker sugar, and also yeah, it's I really like it's that aged. mulatto, not mulatto. Fuck me, uh, Modernero, Modero, sugar in my coffee. Oh, oh. Demidera, Demidera. Oh. That's a 
Yes, yes, yes. Otherwise, I drink coffee black. I get a, that really just nice, just half a teaspoon. Mm, love it. Sorry, mm. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, even yeah, with coffee, that's the, that's the same thing. It's like, it's it's a balance between flavor and uh, function. You know, yeah. whether or not it's like, you're, okay, I can drink one cup of this this coffee and I'm set for the day. Or you're sitting there, you know, it's not, it's not doing as much, but at least it tastes good. Um, at work. We got uh, black rifle coffee or something like that. Yep. Yeah. It's, uh, it's it's an interesting taste. I'm not I not a it. fan. I've always wanted to try black rifle, and I want to try Jeremy's coffee, and I want to try Tim's coffee. I mean, say what you will about them. You know, I'm fans of some of them, not fans of others. I I, I want to try the coffee. I want mm-hmm. to try the coffee. I don't like for me the products the the artist, the art, you got to keep them separate. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. it's, I'm not doing it to support them. I'm doing it for the love of something I enjoy, which is coffee. And if they have a if good you, product, why not tr- want to try it, you know? If oh, you yeah. ever try Phase Connect coffee, you have to let me know because I'm just morbidly curious. I don't like coffee, but I just find it hilarious that Phase Connect has a coffee. Oh, yeah. I don't know who that is. Phase, so... You know VTubers, at least know. know of VTubers. I know Gasly's a VTuber, technically. So VTubers, for those who don't <laughs> have know, a little weeb character up screen. Virtual YouTubers or virtual virtual streamers. So they have a 2D or 3D avatar that if it's live rigged as they move, as they make expressions, their avatar moves around and makes those expressions. Mm. And so like uh so like YouTube robot puppets? It kind of it is mapped to how they're moving, how they're speaking and how they're emoting. Their face or their avatar's face will change to match theirs. So when they're speaking, their avatar's mouth is moving like theirs. When they look to the left, their avatar's eyes track to the left. When they look to the right, their avatar's eyes track to the right. When they turn their head slightly, their avatar turns its head slightly. When they nod, their avatar nods. When they look sad, their avatar looks sad. When they look happy, their avatar looks happy. So it's a way of streaming that you have this animated avatar that actually tracks with what you're doing. But there's a bunch of companies that have these. The largest company is Hololive. And one of the other companies that is fairly large is phase connect phase connect is lovingly known as by its fans the company that hires depressed girls Hmm. depressed insane girls really it is if you say again so it's sex work no that would be (laughs) if you're there's other companies that do that this is just streaming but with a virtual avatar and all phase connect girls are interesting so they're the ones that if you've ever seen a video of a pink anime bunny girl talking about the glowies that's one of phase connects girls that's pipkin pippa then there's one of their girls is a Spurg that really fucking loves TTSs, and, or sorry, TTRPGs and uh, turn-based strategies. Also, RTSs, real-time strategies. So, all their girls are strange in a way that makes them rather endearing. And right. at some point, the company decided, we're going to make coffee. 
so now the running joke is that they're the coffee group that has virtual YouTubers. Right. They're very strange, very endearing. It's if you like listening to people talk bullshit, which if you're listening to us, you probably like people talk bullshit. There's a VTuber somewhere that does very similar stuff. Eh, weebs kind of ruin everything. They can suck it. Yeah, I said it. Fucking weebs. Harry, listen, <laughs> talking to you. And uh, if you want to talk cults, there's other groups that end up developing really cult-like followings. In fact, there's currently one company that its fans are striking at every other company's talents because their company has recently been found out to be a bunch of disingenuous fucks that have... There's a term when it comes to Japanese companies known as black companies. Have any of you heard that term before? Um, uh, I can't say that I have. During so, the summer of love. Summer of love. Yeah, black was it around that time. Those were black-owned companies. Black companies oh. are slightly different. So, black companies are companies that engage in fucked up business practices. So when it comes to the Japanese sense, those are the ones that will try to make you work OT without any additional pay. They'll make demands of you that are completely unreasonable. And if you complain, their response will be, we'll make sure that you never get hired by anyone. Mm -hmm. It's companies that try to fuck over everyone. It's effectively like cannibalistic wizard said, it is as close to a paid version of slavery as you can get in the modern world is mm -hmm. what is summed up by the term black companies. And one of the major VTuber group groups was recently found out to be a black company because they were doing shit like withholding payment from talents. So their streamers, they were just not paying them as they were supposed to. Mm. They were actively psychologically abusing certain talents. And I don't mean psychologically abusing where it's like, well, he told me I need to do my job. No, not that type of psychological abuse. I mean, like, actual psychological abuse. Sharing medical info, that was one of the things that happened. Cannibalistic. Do you know the company that I'm talking about? Because, yeah, it was sharing medical info, sharing legal info. They doxed several of their talents to a bunch of the other people. Shit like that. Really fucked up shit. Mm -hmm. And that company's fans as well as talents have been going after people. So if you are looking at one that ends up fairly cult-like, that company would be the one that currently has the cult market cornered. Not Disney? Not Hollywood? They don't have VTubers currently. You said industry, so whatever. When I was talking about the VTuber, and come on, Andy Circus is the original master VTuber. Let's be let's be real here. That mocap shit. Yo, that's I saw kind of true. I saw the, the 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 trailer for the new Apes movie. Kind of excited. Mm -hmm. I kind of dig that series. I thought it was you know well done. They they didn't. It's not like it's 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 trying to be. It, obviously, it's it's. A soft reboot kind of deal, but it's not trying to be the originals. Mm -hmm. Even kind of hints that it could be in the share same kind of world, whatever. But I mean, they're just good action flicks, whatever. And yeah, rotten. There are a lot of really fucked up idol agencies out there. 
not all idle agencies are fucked up, but when they go bad, oh good god, they go really fucking bad. And exactly, cannibalistic, you got it in one. Yeah, that was the company that ended up burning out a shit ton of its talents and tried to ruin them. Hmm. Ruin their reputations, ruin them financially, as well as a shit ton of other things. One of the strange things that came out was that they would make their talents pay for certain things and then try to take as much of the earnings from the things that they refused to pay for as they possibly could. Hmm. Hey, Six. Oh, Rotten. It's the, the new Planet of the Apes movie. Kingdom Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes? I don't know. Huh. I enjoyed the other two, three. So, is what it is. You know, it actually... Anything huge. I saw the trailer for the newest one. It looks really good. I think I saw, like, the first two. But... Yeah, there's but yeah, do, no, they, three more, but... do they have any more apes based off of black... Racial activists. Oh yeah, the the, the guy because of the uh, was it the puffy bat? vest? Yeah. How goofy is that? He wore a vest just like I sometimes wear a vest. So clearly, it's me. They're trying to say black people are gorillas. No, no, they aren't. <laughs> no, we're saying you're orcs. Wait, shit! Did I say the quiet part out loud? <laughs> God, that, they're so dumb. Those people are so dumb. Yep, and again, it's the thing that drives me crazy. If you're watching Planet of the Apes and you go, I think they mean black people, you're the fucking racist. If you're watching the Lord of the Rings and you go, oh my God, I can't the believe... The Uruk-hai are Jamaican! Yeah, I can't believe that... They had black people murder Boromir. You're the fucking problem. If you're playing you, D and D yeah. and you go, oh my god, the dwarves are all Jews and the orcs are all black people, you're the fucking problem. If you see a description of a race going that they're sapient sapient simians from this one world in a fantasy setting and you go, that's clearly a reference to black people. You're the problem. No one else is going, oh yeah, these sapient simians are clearly black people. That is only you. No one else is saying If you that think the Trade Federation was Asian, you're never. the fucking problem. That one was probably actually kind of true. <laughs> Oh, George, no. <laughs> George, I I, I, I loved his his movies, but like ugh, you, 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 you're treading a little close to the line with that one. Was it the mixing up L's and R's? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The dialect of of basic that they were speaking, as well as the kind of like stereotypes that they kind of drew influence on. It wasn't. It wasn't blatant. You could kind of see references, influences from like. Even the clothes they wore and how they spoke, like it's... oh no, but whatever. They're... <laughs> yeah, the accent was a rehab. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Is that Regal? Wait, what did he just say? <laughs> Regal. I mean, also you know they what? ran a, a very efficient. Uh, manufacturing uh plant and uh yeah i'm just thankful i don't play any kind of modern D because you know wizard of the coast they have the anti-midas touch just like disney yep. everything they touch turns to hot steaming piles of fecal matter yep just, just all of it they they, they went they they got D. &D now it's trash. They get uh, fucking Magic the Gathering. It's now trash. 
I don't know what else they own, but yeah, it's infuriating because they keep on making changes in order to not be racist, and it just comes across infinitely more racist. Yeah. The best result that they could have had when it came to the claims of racism about orcs is wait a second are you saying that you think black people are orcs what the fuck is wrong with you that would have been the only win condition that they had yeah yeah <laughs> but for some reason they went oh no yeah you're right orcs are black people the fuck is wrong with you they they even took a beloved game that had a masterful, well-received, loved formula in Dark Alliance. They mm -hmm. released a new one. Nobody plays it. It's crap. There's mm -hmm. nothing exciting about it. Uh, yeah, I I'm with you on that, Rotten Corpse. I Filmmaking-wise... It was a good movie because, but I mean, the original with Michael Douglas was better. Falling Down, much better movie. Um, but, you know, it was a good movie. It was, you know, I, I, I'm sick of them slapping something like the Joker on top of it. It's just like, but it, it's not really like, it's just, uh, I had the same problem with Nolan movies. Like, okay, they're all, they're all right action comic booky movies but like that's not the joker the mm -hmm. joker isn't just some fucking psychopath and leaving everything to fucking chance and somehow all the pieces fit together like even well the joker isn't organize it like that it the just, joker it, isn't leaving it up to chance the joker is causing as much chaos as possible the yes but, but, but the things happen chance is um two face Two Face is all about no, chance. No, 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 but I, I'm, I'm talking about the story, how the writers wrote the story. There's ah, the, okay. for 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 A, B, and C to happen. X, Y, and Z happened, but X, Y, and Z wasn't planned by anybody because the Joker's just a psychopath who likes chaos and fear and and fucking with people and blah blah blah. And I'm like, okay, but that, but no, yeah, whatever. And but I, I mean, I thought the Joker new one was... it just. I have. To, I don't care. I, I didn't see the hype. It wasn't. Eh. I thought Joker was uh was more of a mantle. Anybody could be the Joker. Well, that's what they were trying to say with that movie kind of thing. But again, I you know you want to see a really good movie about a guy just fucking snapping and not giving and still still being a moral a uh, 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 good person at his core, but then just snaps and like just. The, the the evils of just like everyday society he just death fucking, wish yeah yeah death wish you have death wish oh falling, but falling down was pro is probably my favorite and i would argue the best encapsulating that it was <laughs> such a good i movie. just love I, how insane death wish got as it kept going yeah i mean but you have to you have Hold to on, that's wait, why wait, yeah. what was what was the movie that you after falling down you said what death wish Death Wish? Death Wish? The, yeah. Oh, Death Wish. Okay. Charles it's yeah. a movie about... So the first one is the most grounded of the Death Wish trilogy. I think it was a trilogy, right? Functional? Oh, what? Sorry, sorry. Was I was reading what Rodney Corp said. No, I, I don't mean he's a good person. I mean, in his core, you know, he wants things to be good, but he himself, he does not enact good. It, whatever, it, uh, not to go into the whole thesis of it. Sorry, what was the question? Death Wish was a trilogy, right? Or did it go no. to There's, a... Isn't there like seven of them? Oh, it went to a septology? Okay. I couldn't remember whether it was a trilogy, quadrilogy, or pen... Oh, okay, five, five. Death Wish, 74. Death Wish, two and 82. Three and 85. Four and 87. And then five, which I haven't seen, came out in 1994. Okay, so wow. the first Death Wish movie was the one that made the most sense. In yeah, yeah, yeah. It was Death Wish movie. It was a guy who was just Joe Schmo from Idaho, effectively. 
He had a wife. He had a daughter. And life was pretty good, though it was in... It started in New York, right? Was it New York or L.A.? Oh. I want to say it was New York. Ryan will probably know in a second. I think it was New York, but it's been forever in a day since I've watched them. Yeah, so... Oh, yeah, no, I think it was New York, yeah. In the movie, first one starts off with him just living his life, and then shortly after him just living a very basic life, showing that the city is fairly crime-ridden, his wife gets murdered, his daughter gets horribly assaulted, and the police aren't doing fuck all. And he gets understandably pissed. And then he keeps seeing the crime around yeah, him that yeah. he's been seeing up to this point, but now it's really fucking with him. So he decides that he's going to do th something about it. And he starts taking out criminals. It's the quintessential well, <laughs> vigilante movie. He gets like, or somebody tries he gets, to mug him, he kills the mugger, and that yep. kind of sets him down the path of, this is now r my righteous mission. Yeah, I think, but to, it's, like he's not preachy about it. It's more, it's you know, action movie. It's badass. It's a man's got to do what a man's got to do, kind of level things. Yep, and it's clear that he was going that direction because after the assault, yeah. he started to get weapons and kind of learn how to use them. And then it reaches the point where someone mugs him, and he's obviously been getting more and more pissed off as he's been seeing crimes, and that's when he kills someone for the first time. And then throughout and then the rest of the movie, blood and nothing is sweeter. And he goes on a righteous mission of vengeance to kill a bunch of street punks, which is awesome. Yeah, fucking feel good movie of the century. It is a good movie. The <laughs> reboot is actually not terrible. They did it a wasn't... okay. They did a reboot. Yeah, the reboot starred Bruce Willis. Oh, okay, okay. I yeah. think I have seen that one. The reboot with Bruce Willis, not terrible. It isn't as good because it's done in the like mid 2000s style. Yeah. But it was why, still why pretty like decent. With Bruce Willis, I got it. Okay. I got it. Yeah. See, if with they did, Bruce if Willis. They, it just didn't, Sanguine, if they just didn't call it Death Wish. It'd be a really good, you know, action thriller, man on a vengeance mission kind of thing. But the yep. fact that they had to call it Death Wish, I think, worked to their detriment because then people were comparing it to, yeah, because that I, I'm, I'm just watching the trailer, rewatching the trailer now. I I remember this. I remember it was actually really good because yeah, it that just wasn't scene was just wasn't overly graphic, but it was intense. Yeah, and. It definitely suffered from being named Death Wish because the first Death Wish was just so good, and then the later Death Wishes were just campy insanity. Yeah, like the, they had to ramp it up just to keep it. What was it? Death Wish Four. He's Death Wish blowing he's up. Pretty much got a walker, I think. He's blowing up gangsters with fucking laws and shit like that in the middle of Brooklyn, and no one's doing a fucking thing. Except, actually, no. Saying no one's doing a fucking thing isn't accurate. The police aren't doing anything. The citizenry of Brooklyn are all on his side. It's one of those, what the fuck am I watching? This is amazing, but what the fuck is this? So, it was more in like the death wish one level of seriousness with the reboot and the first one was just so good that it ended up being a yeah this was good i want more of this but it, the original was better <laughs> no sora this is not uh, friday the 13th That's a series that just went on way too long and got 
way too ridiculous. Although, and Mitch Nemo has been had put turned me on to this. Womp Stomp Films, uh, indie filmmakers who do it for the love of the craft on YouTube. Check them out, Womp Stomp Films on YouTube. Uh, did a re like a, a reimagining, but like homage Friday the Thirteenth. I think it's a series now of movies, like full feature length movies. Um, obviously, you got to take it with a grain of salt because it's 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 very low budget stuff. You know, it's it's done for the love of the the mythos, the love of the uh, the, the craft. So it's good in that re regard. But you also got to take in consideration they're not using big Hollywood uh, uh, cameras, so they're not as you know, and and people Polished. are are maybe like acting students or people, older people who've had some acting experience, but not like lifelong, good, great actors, you know? So you got to take that kind of stuff with a grain of salt, but the story being told and how it's being told. Amazing. If you, if you, if you, if you're into that kind of stuff, it's a very niche kind of mm -hmm. genre of a even niche genre. Not very many people are into horror and even less are, are, are into that kind of, what would you call it? Like cerebral gore. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, 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 not so much like seven because seven was just crazy good. But like in that same style of there's some cerebral going on and there's a lot of horror going on and a lot of those elements interplaying with one another. And to respond to something that Rotten said, yeah, mm -hmm. the reboot was, a mixture of yeah. one and two, yeah. But thankfully, it didn't have the daughter get reassaulted because that was one of the that is the most painful part about watching the Death Wish series. Yeah. Every Death Wish movie starts with something happening, something horrible happening to someone close to Charles Bronson, and normally it's his daughter, yeah, yeah. His daughter gets violated like six times in the first four movies. That's still not as not as much as Miles O'Brien from Star Trek: Deep, Deep Space Nine. That guy gets abused, like severely abused, like every other fucking episode, and it's so, oh my god. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah, it and the thing is, in in the first one, and even in the reboot, to its credit, like the stuff that happens is oh, it enough. makes you it's enough and it makes your stomach yeah yeah crawl. yeah yeah and it's enough i don't think you need to pile on to it that's why i mean after the first one i kind of just checked out like I, I saw them back when they came out but man or well shortly after they came out but uh, i yeah eh, okay yeah if you want the full at least it what to... the reboot wasn't total recall because that re yeah. that that's one of those reboots that you're like how do you fuck up total recall yep how but yeah it's one of those... absolutely just shit all over a, a master of action cinema how how yeah, do you his... fail something so completely and utterly and then Kathleen Kennedy's like hold my beer Rotten in the second one, isn't it? his daughter gets violated and then she offs herself? I don't because remember. I remember it being really fucked up in that one. It was fucked up in the first one, but I remember it just being like, oh, fuck. that's the other thing, too. I remember that movie being hard to watch the first time, so I never went back. Yep, that's the thing. If you're watching it the first time, watch it from the start the first time. If you're watching it the second time, jump to like 25 minutes in. <laughs> oh, I binged uh, Fallout. Fucking loved it. Huge Fallout player. Loved the games. Could spend... I, well, I could. I did spend hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of hours playing them all. Fucking loved it. So the show was actually like surprisingly entertaining. There's still some eye roll moments. Like there's this this one person in the Brotherhood of Steel who's a woman in real life playing 
a man, I think, in the Brotherhood of Steel. But kind of somewhat wearing, in one scene, is like wearing a, a very feminine tank top, but has a, like, mustache. It was so weird. It was what, like, it took me right out of everything. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? Because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be, like, a training camp for boys. Like, they, they rescue younger boys, and then they train them to be soldiers. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, mm. you don't see any other women there. So you're just like, is that just a chick with the mustache? And they left the mustache because, because, because it's, it's the wasteland. But I mean, it's, it's still a production. You could have just made them female, but I think you're trying, they're, they're trying to, is, I guess they're saying it's a dude. Like I so confused. Anyway. Um, is that uh, something that's, that's in uh, fallout? Yeah. The show. No, no, it no. just came out. I binged it all. No, no, no. Is that not in the, game. in the game? No, not in the game. No, no, no. Oh, it has nothing to do with it. I mean, the Brotherhood of Steel is in the game. It's a huge part of the game series. Um, that just reminded me of there's a series that I watched on YouTube. I want to say a year or two ago. That was really fucking good. It was what if Fallout was, or what if the Fallout universe progressed if the it was fallout 2 was the one where you started going against the enclave if fallout 2's protagonist had failed and it follows the entire timeline going through all the different sections of each game uh -huh. if the enclave had won fallout 2 and it was rather interesting because they ended up having the fucked up carrier fucked up characters from the Enclave that were legitimately evil still be legitimately evil. Uh -huh. But they had the characters that were more just the okay, he's a professional general. That's what he is. And he actually believes that this is reviving the US. He's bought into everything. But he's a general, he isn't evil, he isn't anything like that. And it's how that character would react to all the shit happening. So it ends with the Enclave having reestablished the US, but almost everyone that had been part of that shit ended up dying because they were really fucked up and this one general had schemed and plotted to take out all the fucked up people. It was a really well done story. I'll have to find the channel that did it. Was it like a YouTube was, thing? Yeah, it was a YouTube thing oh, cool. where it was a series that they had put together in one large video. That was like a four or five hour long story, effectively, hmm. where he's just going through all the events from different aspects of the story and looking at different characters from, I'm trying to remember what general it was. I want to say it was like General Winters or some shit like that. But it was just a really well done narrative. It's kind of like, did you ever read the, or hear one of the TTS versions of the Fallout um, RP story? Nope. Where it was Fallout New Vegas, and the main character had decided to be an Enclave survivor. And the entire setting was against him, but he ends up winning out at the end in a glorious fashion. It's, again, a really good story, but it's one of those, huh, son of a bitch. Hmm. And I also watched uh, A24 Civil War. I'm familiar with that one. Trash. There's only one good 
thing I, 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 I gleaned from that movie is there's a throwaway line where it's about reporters who are reporting the, the fall of America kind of thing. Um, oh, it's, it's weird. It's like 20 years from now. And um, so the main character, Kirsten Dunst's character, is, being ta- is, is talking to this, this other young reporter. And she's like, yeah, and you took that amazing photo during the mass- the Antifa massacre. And I'm like, yes! And, and the rest of the movie was just... Basically, it was a civil war. The 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 president air struck civilians on American soil or something, and like is on his like fifth term or something. I think what they were trying to say was that it was like Trump, but it's 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 played by Nick Offerman, which was kind of cool. But uh, uh, the movie was kind of meh, so stupid, Just so stupid. Every scene, I'm like, this is stupid. This is stupid. This is stupid. You're all stupid. You're 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 all fucking stupid. This is stupid. You're stupid. Yeah, I couldn't stand it. And everybody fucking all the 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 chuckle fuck the YouTube chuckle fucks uh, the 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 grievance grifters you know, the this the neurotics Disparu and 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 drinker and whatever, Tim Pool they're all like oh my god I'm going to go see Civil War. I'm like yeah. oh god this movie is such crap. I hate the doomerism when it comes to shit like that. The oh, there's it going to be a national cool. divorce now. It could have been cool. Why? Why? And it didn't. It, it didn't have to necessarily not center around. Like the story didn't necessarily not have to center around the the journalist. But it was kind of pointless. I don't know. It's just. It's so weird. It's just everything was just stupid. It's. It felt like an exercise. Of hey, let's do this. Okay, and ne- next, oh, next they can do this. And oh, what if they encounter this? It's just, it's so dumb. Oh, and then there's actually there was one other really good scene where they're uh, going to they stop at some you know just middle of the the, the road uh, midwestern gas station, I guess. And you have like the three people, the three dude, the three. I don't want to call them hillbillies, but, you know, country, you know, good old boys standing outside the, the door, you know, with the rifle slung and whatnot. And she's like, OK, how much for uh, uh, a half a tank of gas and two canteens? they will give you 300. He's like, 300? That'll buy you a sandwich. We got ham. We got cheese. And she goes, 300 Canadian. And their eyes light up. They look at each other like, oh, okay. By in that case, and I'm like, it's so funny. It's just like it, it's such a cool idea to to want it to suss that out of how the cessation, the you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be considered doomerism, but I mean, you know, those kinds of air quotes apocalyptic events, future dystopian stuff, it's 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 worked before. Look at you know Mad Max and and Fury Road and all the you know the, it ha- it can work, but if you're gonna do it, you gotta you gotta do it right. And nothing about this was done right, and not even in a good sequence of dumb shit happening. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong, like Armageddon or or Deep Impact or something, because those had value as as like basically comedies. Hmm. They were post-apocalyptic comedies for basically all, or uh, coming apocalypse uh, comedies for all intents and purposes. But they still had some value. They weren't great movies by any stretch of the imagination. This is just like uh, you just you have a great idea and tying it to something that very well could happen, and then just shitting the entire bucket with it. Ugh. And it was so hyped online too. See, the thing that is pissing me off is. I want not utopian, not dystopian. I want hopeful future fantasy, hopeful future or sci-fi. Yeah, hopeful. we used to get that with things like Star Trek. You used to get that anymore. with Star Trek, but I'm saying not just with that. I'm saying there used to be a shit ton of things like that. One of my favorite things from when I was really, really young, and it was always replays because even when... I was young. These had already long since passed. Fringe. But they'd be replayed on 
the various cartoon channels. Oh. The in the future cartoons, where it was my favorite ones are the in the future scientists realize that everyone at Thanksgiving always wants the legs, which can be difficult with large family oh. gatherings. What are you going to do? Get 12 turkeys and cook them all for your family? That's just wasteful. So scientists have crossbred the centipede and the chicken. That's right. The center chicken. And it's a chicken with a hundred legs. And I mean, is yeah. KFC already doing that? So they did predict the future. <laughs> then it's just well, all kinds even of like, yeah. like that. And then it would always end with something strange like, and dear viewers at home, I ask yourself, can you find it within your hearts, within your homes? Within your lives, to find a home for a dear old hoot nanny, and it would be a goat mixed with an owl, <laughs> or something like some along those lines. Shit that they would have put in Fallout too. Yeah, I like that. Always... I like that. That that. What would you call it? Like a utilitarian absurd. Yeah, it, and that's what those yeah. were. They were funny, but they were also extremely hopeful. And there were a lot of those because as the well, like, it also it also even though like a centipede chicken isn't something that we would probably that that we we've done or that we would do, but it's a potential that we could do it. Well, it's an and, idea. That line in, in Jurassic Park, you know, somebody thought up of that that they even go to the extreme of drawing it out and animating it. So yeah. And it's something that's funny, and it's something that's interesting. And again, it's something that is hopeful about the future. And there were all kinds of cartoons Have like you seen that, The Expanse? They, I have not what? seen The you Expanse. You should. Yet. It's recent. Okay. It's really good sci-fi. I'll have to check it out. It is. But they're, they're, oh, sorry. Continue. We'll, we'll talk about it. Now. There were a bunch of those cartoons. It wasn't just the farms of the future, like the one that I was just talking about. But... It was also like in the kitchen of the future. And everyone probably remembers, at least if you're old enough, the image of the robot shuffling a sandwich. And that's from the In the Kitchens of the Future cartoon. Because it was like, in the future, it will no longer be the responsibility of mothers or wives or anyone in the household making lunches for everyone unless they want to. Instead, we'll have helpful automatons doing the job. Like Rosie this the sandwich maker. And it's just a sandwich. Or it's a robot dressed as like a fucking card dealer. Shuffling a sandwich and yeah. then dealing out sandwiches. Uh, tossing out them sandwiches like a blackjack dealer. Yeah. Or you can have it where, you know, shaggy... Uh, uh, shuffles the deck and then uh, fixes his sandwich. Yeah, and it was things like that that were funny, but again, they were hopeful for the future. And one of my favorite sci-fi series that I've read recently is like that. It's the Commonwealth Saga by Peter F. Hamilton. I keep on bringing this author up because it's a vision of the future that I can actually see happening Star Trek was a very hopeful vision of the future, but it was yeah. one that it hand waved away a lot of issues, which always bothered me. Excuse me. Because um, yeah, you can't really just hand wave away <laughs> massive ideological arguments. Yeah, you can. It's called fantasy. It doesn't. That's what, uh, that, that, but, that, but that's what made. Mm. Yeah, TOS very different in that it did it did hand wave a lot of uh, stuff away, but it laid the groundwork for later iterations, the TNG era, those three shows, Enterprise, and and the various B canon level sources to sort of expand on it. So now we have an understanding of you know the the monetary system and and why. All that stuff earlier was just kind of hand waved away. Well, because it's not really space communism. It's 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 just post scarcity. 
like we can provide yeah. for everybody's basic needs and that you know it's not everybody can be in the communist utopia and be an artist no 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 people and 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 you know all those other things so but it's i see what you're saying yeah it's still something that when they just hand wave it away it annoys me which is why i love the commonwealth series because the commonwealth series does not just hand wave it away the commonwealth series has an explanation for what happens so in the commonwealth series humanity has become a multi-planetary species and not just a multi-planetary it is a multi-system species yeah and the way that they address that is yeah there are still people that think that the way to do things is socialism there are still people that think the way to do things is communism there are still people that think the way to do things is by a uh, theocracy what humanity has done is, okay, pick your fucking planet. Go live on it. If it turns into hell, that's on you. If you want to rejoin, sure, we'll accept you back. But we won't accept you back if you try to change everything about everyone else. Deal? And humanity split to the fucking stars. And there are planets that are run in a dynastic fashion. Some of those turn out fairly decent because the dynasty turns out not to be completely insane some of those turn to hell some of the planets that decide to go for a socialist model turn to absolute shitholes in fact most of them do but there's an outlier here and there where they actually manage to make things work enough that it's still going and there's constantly arguments between different setups for worlds on if they're doing the right thing, like one of the worlds that a shit ton of people hate is Huxley's Haven, because everyone is designed for their job. No one is naturally born on Huxley's Haven. Everyone is purpose-made. But it has a hopeful view of the future where it isn't everything has gone to shit. It isn't everything is falling apart. It's everything's really fucking good for the vast majority of humanity. And humanity gets a choice on how they want to deal with shit. If they want to organize a society that follows X, Y, Z, they go, they start a new civilization on a planet. And if it goes to shit, that's on them. They can rejoin at any point. Which is a believable future to my mind. And it doesn't just hand wave away the differences, but there's still that clear sense of humanity's humanity. And in the first portion of the series the commonwealth saga trilogy that starts off the entire commonwealth saga there's a threat to humanity as a whole and humanity as a whole for the most part kind of teams up but there's still portions of humanity that are fucking things up for everyone else which is believable so it's this really refreshing mix of this is something that I can believe this would be a future with these technologies mm -hmm. while not just going, oh yeah, we resolved the issue of sectarian violence. Well, how the fuck did you do that? That would be really nice to know. It doesn't just try to hand wave that away. It goes, ah, now there's certain parts of humanity that we've been dealing with since the dawn of humanity. And we're probably going to keep dealing with them. That's uh, just human nature, but we're going to get better at dealing with them. Mm -hmm. Which is where the hope lies. The idea that we're just going to completely get rid of an issue doesn't seem realistic to me, but 
that will get better at handling it, that will make things better as we go, that is easily believable. Yeah, but again, like they they later go into detail of what happened and basically it's it's you know, humanity base almost uh, destroyed itself. Like we almost destroyed the entire planet and the survivors are the ones who picked up and, and chose a better way to do things and eventually, you know, beat the Vulcans and go out of space. But what's really cool about um, um, the expanse is it's, there's, there's a dystopian element to it, but it's hopeful because you're, even though you're, you're on, on the ride, of these journeys with these characters, you're, you're getting an idea of what the expansion, the early expansion of humanity into uh, the moon, Mars, and the belt, mm -hmm. the, the asteroid belt. Um, and how that kind of plays out. There's also, you know, an element of science fiction, but it's, it's, it grounds itself in very hard sci-fi. So, you know, you're using ion drives and there's inertial forces as ships accelerate and, you know, uh, uh, how they, they fight in space. It's not like you see in Star Wars or, or Star Trek where things, giant city ships are flying like starfighters. You know, that, that's not how it works. No, you have basically boats in space, submarines in space that are firing torpedoes and long range rail guns hundreds if not thousands of kilometers to their target so you know it's it, it's a more believable grounded sort of high but there's it i think it's a really good show i think you know if you're looking for something in the modern era that was good like i, I would say it was good um mm -hmm. yeah you should check that out because uh, i mean dude it's so hard you, you're right in that it's so hard to find something that you can really sink your teeth into as it were like when you when you when you have that itch for a certain genre or feel of a piece, and you really want it, like ugh. I was yeah, hoping, I was what I was hoping to get out of like Invincible or the X Men '97 cartoon was that that revitalization, that that re experiencing of something like Dragon Ball Z or X Men for the first time, like the 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 just si like semi silly, just superhero kind of just that's fun. hopeful. And yeah, that's hopeful. Is, There's a lot of hope there. This is one of the things that you said Just, earlier, weebs ruin everything. But that's kind of where anime is filling the void for a lot of people. Because the problem is most of the shit that, that people recommend me, and I'm talking, you know, people who I would trust their opinions, Harry and Geo and you know, some other people. I watch it, I'm like, I don't like this. This is not what I I don't know. It just it's not me. So which ones they, they, have they, you been they, recommended thus far? I don't fucking remember. Um, things I liked. I liked Dragon Ball to a point. I know it was probably through kid tinted glasses, but that's why I liked Invincible so much as a mm -hmm. comic series because uh, the, the changes that they made to the show, I just don't like. Um, but uh, it's very much just Western Dragon Ball Z. You know, like Mark Grayson is basically just Goku. Um I like that cannibalistic, kind of like, you sadistic son of a bitch. Boko no Pico. I don't know. Don't. Um, <laughs> fuck. I don't know. Ninja Scroll, Record of Lotus War. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's just it's the the the, the part the part about it is I'm just not a fan of the art style, so I don't go looking. But if something is, is good enough, I'll watch it. That makes sense. Because if you want good sci-fi ones and you don't care about it being... Well, the genre doesn't really matter. It just has to be good. Like, so, it, could, it could be high fantasy like Lord of the Rings, like Record of Lotus War. It could be, it could be a fucking samurai movie like... Um, uh, uh, the, 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 what's his name? Kurosawa. Guy. Is that like like oh, a Zatoichi? Zatoichi. Or, or something a little bit more mystical like Ninja Scroll. So uh, if you shot, want, it doesn't matter. Just it, good writing, good characters, and so a couple really good writing, yeah. good character ones to check out. Ghost in the Shell is a classic. 
And didn't it's classic like it. for a reason. You didn't, didn't like, like Ghost it. in the Shell? Nope. Are you sure you watched Ghost in the Shell and not one of the offshoots of Ghost in the Shell? when it came out. Well, I shouldn't say came out. I should say when it was first released in America. Was it just slow for you? Or what was the issue with that one? Because if it was slow, to re- it's going to change I, 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 my I second. I hate to say it, but I have to. I probably have to rewatch it to be like, eh. Because like even even the you know obviously I watch everything or I'll, I try to watch everything. So uh, the 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 one with uh, what's her name, the live action one they made, eh. But they there there's therein lies the thing. I watched the the Cowboy Bebop live action. I was like, okay, this is okay. The Not live action's horrible. garbage. That's what people who watched the original said. And then I'm like, okay, well, I'll try to give the original. I got through I, maybe three quarters of the first episode of, of the first of the anime. And I'm just like, I'm not watching this. So I don't know. I, I, I don't know what to tell you about why, what for me makes because enjoy, for enjoyable air quotes anime. The second one that I was going to recommend, if your issue with, Ghost in the Shell was that it was too slow. You won't like the second one that I was about to recommend because it is slow, but the story is fantastic. Big O. It has some big O. It has some great action in it, but it is much more a mental sort of story. More psychological. Yeah, B I G space O. Big uh, O. Oh, the big uh, O. The big O. Yeah, I, yep. I have to agree. Isn't he like a detective? It's like a kind of like a Batman type thing. Yeah, it's he's trying to figure out because the plot is that almost everyone in the city has had memory loss issues. And he's like trying him. to figure out what's going on. And as he's digging deeper, he finds more and more things that are going on. I mm. can't really be specific without spoiling oh, it. Oh, that's cool. Mm. I like intrigue. I like thriller intrigue kind of stuff like that. And <laughs> the one thing that I will I really say like Goblin it's... Slayer because like that was... People always like we were talking about earlier about D and D. Like people always want to like immerse the, themselves into that kind of a uh, yep. situation, and that was kind of like, oh yeah, well this is what that kind of situation would probably be like for you. So yes, yep. you're probably going to die, yep, horribly and miserably to a pack of fucking kobolds because you're a worthless piece of shit. You're not a hero, and yep. I'm like, I like holy it. shit, yeah, <laughs> but. The one thing that I will say about Big O, because it's Mm. something that you will see the moment that you look into anything about it, it's a mech anime. Yeah, I saw the the head behind him on one of these posters. But it is a very... I like mech anime. Voltron was fucking incredible. Yeah, it's a very cerebral mech anime. Um, um, Gundam Wing was really good. Uh, What was it? Endless Waltz? I think it was okay. Uh, and yeah, Sora I mean, says that they serve different purposes. Like if 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 it's hard again, it's hard to to to, to like fully articulate what it is that draws me to certain things and not other things. It's just you know I I know it when I see it. Mm-hmm. I can appreciate totally when something is well crafted. Doesn't mean I have to like it, and the opposite as well. Just because a movie was crafted like a pile of dog shit doesn't mean. I'm not going to be able to turn off my brain and go, ooh, Avengers. You know? <laughs> I really uh, hated the Avengers movie. Like, But you could turn off, like, because it was just stupid, but turn off your brain and go, oh, shit's blowing up. Oh, look, Iron Man, Hulk. <laughs> you know, get fun. Cannibalistic, you dirty bastard again. So, the big show has a big bad show tonight. The... I started rewatching wrestling. I don't know why, but uh. <laughs> now I'm tempted to recommend a god awful anime just because it's funny and it gets the ridiculousness of wrestling down. 
I know it's not technically anime, but like Avatar The Last Bender is probably the greatest anime thing I've ever seen in my life. Avatar The Last Airbender was really damn good. Even and... though it had cheesy moments and like it was yep. very much subtle enough to keep it PG for the kids. But and... man, did it, it really hit home. Hit hard. The old Avengers, this Harry, old... that was classic. <laughs> Yeah. John Steed with his metal bowler cap. That was a fantastic series. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the remake. The remake was god awful. I or watched reboot, um rather it's a new movie. Uh, I just watched it today. Oh, Damaged. It's got Sam Jackson, and it's mm -hmm. basically if I had to, if you if you like these kinds of. I mean, it's pretty cookie cutter in most respects, like police, crime, serial killer kind of investigation movies. But it's, it's, how can I, how can I, I don't want to ruin anything. It's, it's the Scottish version of Seven. So take that for what you will. But that's what I was thinking when I was watching it. And if you like that kind of caught intrigue kind of stuff, it's actually kind of good. It's really mm -hmm. entertained by it. It's, it's, Sam Jackson, Chicago cop, uh, retired. Is Sam Jackson related to Sam Jackson? Sam Jackson? Well, you said Sam Jackson. Oh, uh, I slurred. Uh, <laughs> you became Sean on, Connery man. for a moment. Come on, man. Um, and uh, a serial killer that he never really solves the crime of turns, you know, turns up that there might be a copycat or he might have escaped to scotland so he goes to scotland hooks up with this this scottish the main character who's the the scottish detective and if the hilarity ensues but you know it's it's one of those types of movies it's it fucks with your head a little bit it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. it's good to to find things that aren't just complete trash you know what i mean yeah but like I said, one of the things that I want more of, oh, and it's anime. one of the reasons why I do like some animes, is I don't want everything to be everything sucks, might as well fucking die. Which is where a lot of movies end up. They go to the everything's going to suck, everything's going to hell, the future's going to be god-awful, you're better off dying now. I want it to be as basic of a story as it is, I want the classic Western. I want the good guy in the white hat versus the black guy in the black hat. In How droll. A, say again? How droll. Yeah, I want that every now and then. I don't want every movie to be that, but <sighs> no movie being that is fucking miserable. Yes. Yes. I, 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 I see where you're going with that. And it does happen. It does happen. But it's, it's you know, I, I say so droll, you know, half tongue in cheek in that yep. it's droll if you do it wrong or you do it poorly. You can still do the, 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 the hero's journey, the good white hat guy. Versus the the evil, just inherently evil motherfucker. You can have that, but because it's so... I'm trying to pick my words. It's so easy to get into a cookie cutter state that you could ruin the product entirely. I'd say it's even harder than doing something that has a little bit of a, uh, a plot twist intrigue kind of stuff that, you know... It's one of those somebody like an M Night gives... Shyamalan just does, and it's just like it's just stop, just it's... stop. The thing is that it gives you nowhere to hide when you do a show like that. When you have a story that is good guy versus bad guy, it gives you nowhere to hide. And when you have nowhere to hide, if you're good, it's amazing, and it becomes clear that you're good. If you suck, it becomes clear that you suck because you can't hide behind anything to make people go, well, maybe, 
maybe it was just misunderstood. No, no, it's very clear. You sucked. It's I'm, kind I'm... of like the reason why a lot of restaurants will have the omelet test or mm -hmm. will do a cook a steak. Your only seasonings are salt, pepper, and garlic. Because there's nowhere to hide. There's nowhere to dodge. There's no way to cover up a fuck up. You have to do everything perfectly. And then it's amazing. But Wait, if you fuck up on something, it sucks. That's what I'm hoping Monkey Man is. I still haven't seen it. I'm waiting for... I've heard bad things. Really? Eh. Yeah. It, it looked like it could be another one of those... John Wick kind of like, you know, you just have a, a guy who's ob quite obviously the good guy. You have a guy who's quite obviously the bad guy and he needs to go through that journey to become the weapon to take down the bad guy kind of thing. I, that's what I was hoping for, but you know, who, uh, who knows? Yeah, With, according uh, to tell, like, Johnny and Camel, they've tried to tack in the message. Mm, mm. And they've been very clear that they've been trying to tack in the message. Okay. You know, Which it happens. I'll, I'll still watch it because I want to watch it, but I'm I'm just trying to think, like, because you're you're right. Like recently, recent time, there hasn't really been like I'm I'm going through things that I've seen, and it's like I can't really think of anything that's like. So well done, good guys versus bad guy kind of thing. Yeah. That they didn't completely screw. Because, I mean, that's that's what Star Wars was. Just a simple, classic, original. well done, yeah, original movie. Yeah. Yep. And the thing is that they keep on trying to make the villains sympathetic. Sympathetic, redeemable, and... and they yeah. seemingly try to do the exact opposite for the heroes, which I'm perfectly fine with a well-done, sympathetic villain. Someone that you understand where the fuck they came from. But make them so that the story that you're giving them actually explains where they're coming from. And when they eventually die, you want to throw your hands up in the air and go, yes, not, oh, well, I guess that's that's the way it had to have been. Like, it's tragic that it had, no, no, he's the bad guy. Kill millions, millions. You're a bad guy. You should be elating. Don't, why, why are you, uh, it just, I, I hate it when they do that. I th I hate to say it, but well, a weird a weird connection would be they wouldn't do this type of shit with Hitler. They wouldn't sit there and be like, "Oh, let's try and build a, a sympathetic uh, character with this person, and then have him go through all this shit." And I, and and again, I know I'm sorry. We're probably going to be a. Uh, roasted for this because i mentioned the the very name but um it it, it just is it, that's what it is is they want to take people who are who are monstrous and they'll sit there and say oh but because they had this type of upbringing or because this happened to them before all of this this happened this is why this is uh not a villain and see there's something that drives me crazy because there was a show that did an amazing job or a movie rather that did an amazing job of humanizing the normal villains jojo's rabbit did any of you see Juju see jojo's rabbit no no or jojo rabbit i think not Jojo's Rabbit, but Jojo Rabbit. So, do you know the premise of Jojo Rabbit? Well, I don't, we haven't seen it, so I don't know. But I'm asking, did you remember any of the, like, previews or anything like that? Never saw anything about it, so no. So, Jojo Rabbit, I highly recommend seeing it. But it is 
Is a rabbit hey. involved? No, it's the nickname of someone. So in Jojo Rabbit, the premise is that you're following around this kid during Nazi Germany. So it starts kind of before the turning point of the war. And you're following around this kid. He's part of the Hitler youth. He loves Hitler to the point where Hitler's his imaginary friend. And he goes to a Hitler youth training camp where they do all kinds of fun things like learn to hate the Jews and throw grenades, shoot various rifles and handguns. Shit like that. Oh, but we're definitely during, getting tagged. <laughs> during this, he ends up getting called a coward because he freezes up at one point. So in order to show his bravery, he steals a grenade from someone and goes to throw it. He doesn't throw it far enough. He gets blown up. And he gets fucked up in the explosion. So he's no longer able to do what he was intending to do. He's on crutches for a period of time, has a bunch of scars, but he still wants to help out the German war effort. So he signs up to be a carrier for the local Wehrmacht general. And his mother is always trying to make him happy and always trying to get him to be who he is, not just who he thinks other people want him to be. And she is extremely supportive. As the story goes on, he finds a Jewish girl that his mother has been keeping from the Nazis in their house, hiding just in their walls. And he's having to deal with that. His view of all Jews are evil, but he's a young boy. She's a little bit older and he starts to kind of fall for her. So he's having to deal with that shit as well. And at the same time, the war is turning against Nazi Germany. So he's having to deal with that. And as the story goes on, more things start to happen. More characters start to show doubts and events progress. It's, really sad at a bunch of different points. I don't want to go too deep into the story because if I do, it would ruin the plot in case you guys go to see it. But it does a very, very good job of breaking people into a bunch of different groups. You have the people that realize what's going on is wrong. You have the people that don't realize what's going on is wrong. Mm. You have the people that realize that what's going on is wrong and they fucking love it. You have the people that realize what's going on is wrong and they're trying to change it. You have the people that are coming to realize what's going on is wrong. And then they fall into one of the previous two camps and you have the people that don't realize it, but they think that everything's good. And characters will move between these groups as the story goes. And it does a really, really good job of that. And there's one moment in particular at the very end that makes the movie amazing. Because a character does something to save someone else while damning himself. Because while he doesn't really deserve the punishment that he's going to get, the person that he saves sure as hell doesn't. Hmm. And you can tell that that's what the character is thinking as he's working through it in his mind. And then 
he doesn't warn the other character. He doesn't tell the other character what's going to happen. He just acts on it because he needs that immediate response, that immediate moment of that character feeling like he's betrayed them to save them. And it hits. And it hits fucking hard mm. in that moment. And it's really well done. And the strangest thing is that it does that. Again, beautifully. It breaks it up into those groups so that it's not just everyone in Nazi Germany was evil, but it was there were evil people in Nazi Germany. There were people that were just stupid in Nazi Germany. And there were good people trying to do the right thing in Nazi Germany. And then the director, Taika Waititi, started doing interviews. And in his interviews, it became absolutely clear. Taika Waititi had absolutely no fucking clue what he had made. Sounds because like his MO at this point. It's not surprising, but it's depressing because of how good the movie was with the things that I've laid out, with how amazing of a job it did. With each point just landing beautifully. And then turns out that the director has no clue what the fuck he was doing doesn't think that the movie has at all the message that it clearly has when you're watching it. Mm -hmm. Because this was during the time that Punch a Nazi was really popular. And throughout the entire movie, it was very much, there's a way to change people's hearts and minds. And just Assaulting them doesn't do it. That was very clear throughout the entire movie. And despite that being very clear throughout the entire movie, Taika Waititi, while the movie was in theaters, came out and went, yeah, punch Nazis. <sighs> and you're just going, but you... Your movie was fantastic. Your movie actually told people how to change hearts and minds. And it showed it in action in the movie. Why? Why are you just absolutely missing the point? You wrote this movie. You directed this movie. But like I said, it's a fantastic movie. I highly recommend it. And if either of you guys see it, I'm definitely game to talk about it more. Because, like I said, it was a really good movie when you watch it and you actually take in what's happening and what the people are saying and how the people are acting throughout the movie. Mm -hmm. It fucking works. Cool. And it's one of the movies where Scarlett Johansson is an amazing actress in the movie. And there's not many movies that I can say that where I'm going, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson, just, oh my God, fantastic performance from Scarlett Johansson. She's not often a miserable actress, but she's not an amazing one most of the time. I, I put that more onto the movie she's in because Lost in Translation, uh, apparently what you're telling me from JoJo, um, Lucy wasn't a great movie, but she was really great in it. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen <sighs> Lucy. I just know the that I've seen The character of Widow before Black Widow was actually kind of good. Yeah, um, in, before in Iron that, Man she 1, was good. 2, and 3. Sorry? Yeah, before that, she was good. It, after that, the, so I the think character she, she really took a turn. But I yeah. wasn't sure how much was... She did have some really good moments, but it 
wasn't entirely clear how much was her acting and how much was the director or whatever. Yeah, no, I get yeah. you. I get you. I'm just saying, like, I mean, there's there's evidence to say that she can act, so, you know. Yeah, like I said, she wasn't a bad actor, but she's one that I would just say is an actress. Take it or leave it. She isn't an amazing act, or she isn't a good actor. She isn't an amazing actor. She isn't a bad actor. She's an actress, and that's kind of where I would place her. Yeah, where it's, she's no, like, she, it's not for her. Her name is not, is not a draw, and it's not a deterrent when I'm looking for something to watch, you know? Yeah, she's a competent actress. Yeah, as long as you're not going to make me have to, like, sit through two hours of her trying to be an actress, I, I'm, I'm generally fine with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it had a bunch of other really good actors in it as well, like Sam Rockwell is in it. Fucking love Sam. Yeah, and Sam Rockwell plays the German, I want to say it's either colonel or general. I think he might have started as a colonel in the movie, but then he gets promoted to general. And he's been given awards for being a hero of the nation, effectively. But he's very disaffected at the very start of the movie. It's after he's already been injured in war. And he's now returned home. He's a drunk. But he's a kind of put together drunk, still functional drunk. And then immediately after, he's part of the camp that Jojo gets injured at. And this isn't really spoiling anything because this is maybe the first 10 minutes of the movie, tops. After Jojo gets injured, it kind of sobers him up. And he starts having to engage with things more after that. So you get to see his character and how his character changes. You get to see how Jojo's character changes. You get to see how all these different people change. And if they change. And like I said, it's just a really damn good movie when you take it for its value and you don't listen to what the director says the point was when you don't listen to what the cast thought the point was. But you just watch the movie and you take it in yourself. Mm -hmm. Because it very much reminded me of the Hogan's Heroes thing with Schultz and Clink. Where Schultz and Clink, they were Wehrmacht officers. Or Schultz, or Clink was a officer. Schultz was a sergeant, so he was enlisted. But you have these characters that are part of the Wehrmacht, which a lot of other series would make them evil. Because they were part of the Fairmont and they fought for the Nazis. No, oh, that's evil. But one of the things that both of them insisted on when it came to having their or having their roles in that series was Commandant Clink's actor insisted mm -hmm. that. The Nazis must never be seen to win at any point. By the end of an episode. So they could be kind of winning in the middle, but then they have to be defeated by the end of the episode. Every time. By the end of the episode, the Nazis have to be defeated. Which, that was a really important concession that made that show what it was. Schultz had the even more important one. Which was that there had to be a distinction between the German people, the Wehrmacht, and the Nazis.
And that distinction had to be clear. And that's why Schultz is Schultz. Because Schultz was that happy, very nice. You could picture him if it wasn't during the war. Surrounded by a bunch of kids and grandkids. And having a fantastic life. Because he was this portly, older, happy man. But then that made everything that he was associated with even more terrible because even this portly, happy man was participating in it. But at the same time, you couldn't hate him because he was just so jovial, so lovely of a character. So it made it a lot more complex by having that single concession. Mm hmm and you don't get that from the SS in Hogan's Heroes. When it was an SS character, the SS character was a bumbling buffoon and evil. Mm -hmm. When it was a German, they could be good, they could be evil. They could be somewhere in between. And they could be competent or they could be bumbling, just like anyone else. And it was the same thing with the Wehrmacht, that the Wehrmacht, they would be shown as fairly professional. But they would often not like the Nazis. They would just be doing what they were told to the letter of what they were told, not necessarily the spirit of what they were told. And that made it a very different show than if they didn't have those concessions. And yes, there is Look Who's Back, which is the movie about Hitler in the 21st century. Or does it go in the future? Yeah, it, it's a movie where Hitler... I can't remember how he ends up in the 21st century, but it's Hitler in the 2000s in Germany. Oh, geez. And him reacting to that and how he would react to modern day Germany. It was a very strange black comedy. I think he even... Harry, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't he even run for office in the movie? And I just realized what time it is. Oh, it's Look Who's Back. Right, 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 right. Yep, Look Who's I Back. I remember seeing the promotional stuff of that. Never watched it. Who was in it? A mm. bunch of German actors. No. Yeah. Because it was a German movie. Well, the guy who played Hitler was actually Italian. Oh, he was Italian. Nice. But the rest of them are, yeah, basically Germans. I wonder if they had to get an Italian because they couldn't... No, just because I, I think it's just because he looked the part. See, part of me goes it's probably because he just looked the part. Part of me is thinking because they went to a bunch of German actors and said, oh, we think that you'd be perfect to play Hitler. And the German actor went, no! Nine, 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 nine! <laughs> Those crazy Germans. You know what I'm talking about, squirts. Because <laughs> I could easily imagine that being what happened. That they went to a bunch of German actors and the German actors were like, fuck no. <laughs> I'm not doing that, no. Yeah. I like hey, having a career. I thought you said I was going to play Charlie Chaplin. Yeah. But I did just notice the time. Shall oh. we go around the horn for parting words? But Sure. It's just one word. So you want your parting word to be butts? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Adam? Um... Well, I had a lot of fun chatting with you both. 
this evening uh, on Friday. Always um, a lot of fun. Yeah. Um. So yeah, hope hope to have some good conversations in the future. Uh, God bless and love y'all. I'll leave off with my standard of if you're passionate about something, make sure that you devour it. Don't let it devour you. And with that, have a good night all. The zoo is closed. By the way, the guy who played Hitler in Inglorious Bastards was German, so that... Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but he was Hitler in an American movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would he have been so keen to be Hitler in a German movie? Well, it's an international hit, so I don't know. True. Bye. But yeah, good night, good night all. <laughs> it's a big show. Dun, 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 dun. And now it's